It's not quite 12 10, but I'm going to use my prerogative to get us started at least with some thank you so I can get those in and then get to the featured extra special guests we have. Uh, which I'll do too short of an introduction. They deserve long introductions, but I want to get to the conversations uh, rather than just do the introduction. So I guess I got to start with myself. Hello, everybody. I'm Doug Berman. Uh, and I am a professor here at the College of Law, as well as the faculty director of the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. And we are extraordinarily excited that you joined us today for the 2024 Menard Family Lecture on Drug Policy and Criminal Justice, uh, featuring the chair of the U.S. Sentencing Commission, the Honorable Carlson Reeves, who's our extra special guest, but I couldn't resist a chance to make it a, a particularly a judicious afternoon by also inviting two uh, of our very own Southern District of Ohio Federal District Judges, Chief Judge Allison R. Marbley and Judge Douglas Cole, and they're going to, uh, I don't know, quite comment or discuss or just engage in a conversation uh, about uh, sentencing and the work of the U.S. Sentencing Commission after we have uh, Judge Reeves talk about the work that he's been doing since he's chaired the commission starting two years ago in 20. 22. Let me do a little bit of a formal introduction of Judge Reeves and then give the podium to him. Uh, he's a native of Yazoo City, Mississippi, and assumed uh, office in December of 2010, having been nominated by President Barack Obama. Uh, before then, he was engaged in the private practice of law uh, with uh, Pinkett Reeves, a firm he helped start uh, in 2001. The focus of his practice was state and federal lit litigation. This comes after Judge Reeves was a magna cum laude graduate of Jackson State University with a major in political science. He obtained his law degree from the University of Virginia Law School in 1989. Upon graduation, he clerked for Justice Ruben Anderson of the Mississippi Supreme Court and then became an associate uh, of the Phelps Dunbar Law Firm thereafter. He also served a stint as Assistant U.S. Attorney Chief of the Civil Division for the Southern District of Mississippi. There's a lot more in terms of awards and accomplishments, but I'm going to stop there and just uh, encourage you to thank, uh, join me in thanking uh, Judge Reed for coming and spending a little time talking about what he does on the Sentencing Commission, where he deserves credit for bringing to life what had become a more abundant agency. Uh, I know this way too well, uh, but it's worth highlighting that for about four years, the U.S. Sentencing Commission lacked a quorum because of uh, the lack of confirmed nominees, uh, and Judge Reeves was a slate, or a slate of nominees that was confirmed uh, in summer 2022, and the amazing work that he and his colleagues have been doing at the commission uh, is keeping me in a job, so that's always nice, and even more importantly, is helping to direct the course of justice uh, in our federal courts through the sentencing enterprise in ways that uh, continue to have echoes and we're gonna hear a little bit more about right now. So without further ado, just brief, thank you so much for coming. Good morning. Thank you, Professor. Berman or Berman or Doug or whatever. Um, I, I'll tell you all this, it's, it's a pleasure to be uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, my first time here. But I won't be confused with Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, uh, we have a Philadelphia, Mississippi, and I remember a young lady uh, uh, who went to Jackson State was visiting Yazoo City with one of my friends and I, I was in law school and uh, uh, I had one of my friends from law school down there visiting me that about So the young lady introduced herself. She said, you were from Philly. He got happy. He's like, oh yeah, you're from Philly. And she said, what part of Philly? He said, Philadelphia. And he said, Philadelphia? He said, what part of Philly? And, and we looked at him crazy. We know what part of Philly she was from. He was Philadelphia, Mississippi. <laughs> so, so it's good to be here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, uh, and I, I do want to also say this here, and, and, and he's embarrassed every time I give him a, a plug. But the first time I met uh, Professor Burke was in 2011, I think, uh, in San Diego, I believe. Uh, or or L.A. or San Diego, it was for a citizen conference. And uh, he was one of the feature panelists 
and he uh, brought to our attention uh, his sentencing law and policy blog uh, that he uh, was doing. I'll tell you how long it was been. Uh, back then. Uh, there was a commissioner who I met that time, whose name was Katanji uh, Jackson uh, Brown. Katanji Brown Jackson, excuse me. Uh, uh, she was a commissioner back then, and she was on that panel. And immediately after that panel, I went up and uh, uh, talked to Professor Berman about this blog that he had. And I, and I then went back to my chambers, and that's one of the go-to blogs that I sort of go to uh, on a periodic basis, like daily, just to see, just to see what might be occurring on sentencing and criminal law issues. But it's my pleasure to uh, uh, to be here, uh, and and I'm not going to uh, speak long because I. I want to engage in this conversation with these esteemed judge friends of mine uh, to talk about the issues on the ground, because the issues on the ground in Southern District of Ohio might be a little bit different on the ground than in the Southern District of Mississippi. They might be a little bit different than the Northern District of Ohio, I would tend to believe. I'm not sure. But one common thread is uh, the criminal law that Congress has uh, uh, adopted and that we are, uh, as judges, are required to follow, interpret, and, and as prosecutors are, are, in, uh, are in control of uh, administering. Uh, my route to the Citizens Commission uh, is one that if you had talked to a young Carlton Reeves in college, it would not have been on the bingo card, as you would say. It would not be anywhere in the hearing. Uh, even if you talk to Carlton Reeves as a young boy, because my general practice was not the criminal law. Even if you talk to the Carlton Reeves who was at the U.S. Attorney's Office for a number of years. And when people called me, uh, uh, you know, when they look back at my uh, uh, bio and they say he was a prosecutor at the Department of Justice, I have to correct them. Well, I was in the Department of Justice. I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, but I was the chief of civil affairs. So I defended the actions of various agencies and and did some civil enforcement, and even represented a young man uh, who was a census worker, who uh, in 2000, in the 1990s, getting ready for the 2000 census, he was charged with trespassing on the property of a person who wanted to go after him simply because he was a young black man trying to do his job. But what we did was we removed the case to the federal court, uh, to the master judge, to have it tried uh, there. Uh, and ultimately, that case uh, was dismissed because this young man was, was where he should have been. He was not trespassing. He was doing his job. But if you talk to the calls and reads back at the U.S. Attorney's Office, he probably would not be talking to a Carlton Reeves who thought maybe he would one day uh, be involved uh, so heavily in the criminal justice system. Even after having uh, uh, left the U.S. Attorney's Office to open up my own firm uh, with the former U.S. Attorney and another AUSA, they did the white collar stuff. I did. So you still would not have seen or or if you had talked to Carl to read in, you say, well, what might you be doing? And, you know, uh, uh, later on, what might you be doing? Well, serving on the Citizen Commission, again, was not one of those things uh, that would have been on the mind of Carl to Reeves. And fast forward to the time that 
cause and read to serve it on the bench uh, as a district judge. And yes, a great swath of my case uh, low, uh, not a great, uh, that's, that's a misstatement, is not criminal justice. It's not a, 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 a criminal cases make only a, a small part of my docket. Most of my docket, as I believe most judges, most of their dockets are actually uh, of the civil cases that uh, work on. Uh, the criminal cases are all dictated by the prosecutor and what they bring. So even if you had talked to me during the 10 years or so, 11 years that I was serving on the bench, would the sentencing commission be something? Uh, yes, I thought about criminal justice issues. Yes, I've sentenced people. Under, and I've always been curious about criminal justice. How do we act? How do, can we emphasize the justice part of our criminal justice system? So that's what you would have been talking to Carl and Reeves about. How can you make this system work a bit better? So the opportunity did come up for me to uh, uh, consider being nominated to the uh, Sentencing Commission. And I am so very grateful that that opportunity has come because I've learned a lot about me. I've learned a whole lot about the sentencing guidelines and the sentencing systems under which we operate. I've learned a lot in working with my fellow commissioners and, and the work that we are doing, I must underscore, cannot be done without the work of the other commissioners. And as Professor Burnham mentioned, this was the first year in about eight years or so that you had a full commission. We, you, we, they were without a quorum for four years. So there were four years that uh, uh, the, the commission could not act because there was no quorum. And there, were, there was uh, at least a year or so before we were nominated and confirmed that the commission consisted of <laughs> Justice Charles Brock, Judge Charles Brock. He was a chairman, he was a commissioner, he was the one of one, and I tease him all the time. I said, it's hard if you disagree with yourself, Judge Brock. <laughs> uh, but, but there was very little that the commission could do, you know, because you just didn't have a body to act. Now, that does not mean that the commission itself was not working, because in 2022, for example, uh, uh, the, the staff on the commission, which consists of researchers, uh, policy people, uh, trainers, they were still working. And for those persons who know, we were receiving reports uh, on our guideline system, we were receiving, you know, research that was done, whether it was research on recidivism or some other various topics, the work was being done uh, by the staff. But with respect to the commission itself, the commissioners were not there. But in two, uh, 2021, excuse me, uh, we were confirmed in August of 2021, and we began to work. But what did that commission look like? What did this new commission look like? Well, the commission is composed of uh, some vice chairs, for example. There's uh, uh, Vice Chair Phil Restrepo, their Vice Chair Claire Murray, and their Vice Chair Laura May. And it also includes commissioners, John Gleason, Clary Horn Boone, and Candace Wong, and there's the chair of the commission, me. But the diversity there on that commission is important, crucially important. Judge Restrepo, for example, brings a background having been a federal defendant, having been a magistrate judge, having been a district judge, is currently a judge on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Claria Horn Boone was a commissioner. She, a former AUSA, who 
who now sits uh, as one of the few judges who sits in two different judicial districts, uh, Eastern District of Kentucky, I believe, and the Western District of Kentucky. So she brings in that perspective. We're going to talk about those different types of perspectives. You have John Gleason, a former AUSA, a former district judge who's uh, uh, in New York, EDNY, uh, Eastern District of New York, who had a long history of being a federal prosecutor, taking down the gangs and all that, but, but also was a district judge for a number of years. And he brought in that experience. Uh, uh, Claire Murray was a deputy uh, principal attorney uh, general. So she brings in that policy perspective. So you think about who these people are. You have Vice Chair Laura Mate, who was who has, for most of her career, served with the Sentencing Resource Council. That is, she has gave advice to the various federal defenders uh, across the country. And you have Candace Wong, who's a current AUSA, back in our District of Columbia, which brings in a totally different perspective from the type of work uh, of uh, other AUSAs do out the ground, but she has some there by the crime unit, and we know the uniqueness of the U.S. Attorney's Office or the district courts uh, there in the District of uh, Columbia. When you have those different types of perspectives, for example, Judge, as I said, Judge Boone uh, sits in two districts now, so there are two different U.S. Attorney's Offices that have cases that she has to preside over. Different perspective on charging decisions. Different perspectives on how plea offers are bargained. Different perspective on interest of diversion programs possibly. Different perspectives on whether or not uh, the office might bring something that requires a mandatory minimum or not. Or if you need some sort of discretion uh, 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 to the to the judge, different perspectives is 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 and, 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 and just think about what Judge Restrepo sees. You know, he's a Third Circuit judge, so he sees stuff from the Virgin Islands, from Pennsylvania, from New Jersey, and other places. I mean, at, but but that's after having served as a district judge in Philadelphia. And then you have someone like me, a district judge there in Mississippi, who sees things from the Mississippi perspective, how from all different points might log up against people and how they are logged up and how, how that might affect their sentencing. We see a, a sort of a different perspective and a different experience on how our youth court systems might work we were talking earlier with a group of students today, and you think about some crimes that might call for criminal history of uh, uh, courts in Mississippi. Sometimes those crimes could have been committed in misdemeanor court, and in those misdemeanor courts, in our justice court systems, you don't have to be a, 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 a lawyer to be a judge in those, in those courts. All you have to do is have a G, G, I think you might have to have a, no, I think all you have to do is have a GED. I don't even think you need a high school diploma. You just have to run for the office and you have to win. So, so the, just think about that sort of, uh, of, of, of system where you're calculating people's criminal history scores and criminal history reports because that is a part of what might be relevant on a sentencing for an individual later if they are to get into the uh, criminal justice system. So that unique set of experiences and differences that all of us bring, because Congress told the world back in 1984 that uh, we're going to create this sort of sentencing guideline uh, sentence that used to be mandatory. Uh, we're going to create this sort of system 
uh, 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 so that we can root out, hopefully, the disparity in sentencing. And so Congress told this commission to look at the data, follow the research, make sure that these policies and things, these guidelines that you are implemented are tethered to the policy, are tethered to the research. And, and you base your, 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 your guideline system on that. They told us to go, go do the research. They told us to receive the comments from the public, from the stakeholders, the stakeholders being the defendants, the stakeholders being the prosecutor, the stakeholders being the probation officers, the stakeholders being the practitioners, those who represent the de defendants, those who prosecute the defendants, the stakeholders being all of the persons involved in the criminal justice system, including the victims. You hear from them all. And as a part of that, the commission hears from them all. On our last cycle, for example, not the most recent one that we're currently in, but with the cycle that ended uh, last year, we had over 8,000 uh, comments to come in. Now, I can tell you every one of them were read. I cannot tell you that I read every one of them. <laughs> but everyone was read. We had comments to come in from judges. We had comments to come in from victims. We had comments to come in from the currently incarcerated because we've set up a portal to make sure that their voices can be heard. It's all available to you on our website, www.ussc.gov. So what we do is we have, we send out proposed priorities. These are the things that we think ought to be going on in our criminal justice system. We give you an opportunity to comment on what the proposed priorities are. And then from that, we decide what will be the priorities. What, what are the aspirations of the Convention for any given year. Last year, the list was long. It was about 13 or 14 priorities. It was a long list of uh, 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 things because, again, the commission had not been in a place where it could function. So last year it was long. This year is much shorter, uh, but it still has got, has called for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of comments. And we'll talk a little bit about what our last year thing, I assume that the judges will, will tell us whether or not some of the stuff we did last year is working or is workable and what we might have on the horizon for this year. What is on the horizon for this year? Well, we have hearings later this week, later this week on the current set of priorities. The, 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 the things that are uh, mostly primary are uh, acquitted conduct. <laughs> what you say about acquitted conduct? I know one else here who might be in the audience of thinking, well, if you're acquitted, you go home. Well, sometimes you do. Sometimes you might be acquitted on one count, uh, might be convicted on another count, but uh, the Supreme Court has said under the Constitution that even if you're acquitted on another count, but you're convicted, the acquitted conduct uh, can be accounted for in your sentence, even though you've been acquitted. We may even hear Professor Berman talk about his McClinton case uh, 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 from last year. But even if you're acquitted, uh, under the Constitution, the court said, is that that's relevant conduct that can be placed in your con uh, consideration for your uh, sentence. But the Sentencing Commission has taken that issue up at somewhat out of deference to the Supreme Court. They denied cert in, his, in, in the McClinton case and the others, and there were a couple of opinions that said, well, maybe the Sentencing Commission ought to look at it. They should look at it because 
you know, we are involved in sentencing. So whether it is appropriate under the Constitution, is it appropriate in our sentencing structure to think how much can we look at acquitted conduct and also pair it with it being relevant considerations for sentencing. So we're having hearings on that, on that issue. That is the first subject to come up on Wednesday. We're going to hear from the criminal law committee. We're going to hear from the Department of Justice. We're going to hear from the federal defenders. We're going to hear from the practitioner advisory groups. We're going to hear from formerly incarcerated individuals. We're going to hear from all of these people. So the other uh, major topic, that one other topic that we'll be talking about, alternatives to incarceration. Because alternatives, uh, I, I, I spoke to a group back here, and uh, there's an author that may be coming out in federal sentence and reform that talk about the alternatives to incarceration. And frankly, the research shows that prison itself in the United States used to be an alternative to incarceration. Uh, was an alternative sort of system. We didn't have many prisons. We didn't do prison things. And about 100 years ago, even under the federal system, I think, about 90% of the uh, sentences that were imposed were non-prison sentences. Now, about 90% of the sentences imposed under the federal system are prison sentences. And one of the things we don't we do and should not shy away from and, and, and sort of escape is that we, the federal system, only deals with a small portion of the Mrs. Uh, excuse me, of the United States prison system. Obviously, you know, every state has its own state laws, and those persons who are incarcerated are incarcerated in the state court systems. But we, as a citizen commission and as a body and as a uh, as we are in the federal system, we want to show some leadership and courage on how things ought to be done. And maybe what we do can influence uh, some of our uh, states on how they do business. So a lot of what, what we do is to make sure that the research is out there and that it's top notch and, and all that. Which leads me to the other really big point that we will be uh, looking at. Oh, uh, uh, I think Thursday's hearing is mostly dedicated to brain science, youthful offenders. How should children be dealt with in our criminal? Justice. Again, I always emphasize that point. Our criminal justice system. How are our children dealt with? We know that science, if we follow science, we know that the Supreme Court has even recognized in Miller and Graham and these other cases that children are different. And they are. Anybody who is the a uh, parent of a 15 or 16 year old boy, <laughs> know that they're different. <laughs> uh, uh, and those parents with uh, 15 or 16 year old girls know that they're 16 year old boys that they were great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it doesn't matter. We all know that boys will do things and we are. I mean, we've been boys, right? We will do things together in a group that we will never do on our own. And so the, the science sort of follows that. And, and there is something about the brain, and we're going to hear all about that. We have received written testimony and comments already, but we're going to take on the uh, 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 live testimony on, on Thursday on these issues. So what does that have to do with the sentencing guidelines? Because, of course, the guidelines are composed of looking at a lot of things, including your history, your criminal history of having uh, 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 served uh, sentences, having been 
prosecuted before. Uh, because uh, for those of you who don't know, if you ever get involved in the federal system uh, and you're having to stand there before a judge after having played guilt or otherwise been convicted of something, there's going to be a detailed pre-sentence report on your life going back to the time that you were due up to the time of, of your conviction on that particular case. And sometimes there are juvenile uh, convictions there. There are, there have been, you know, arrests, convictions. And again, coming from where I, you know, again, this diversity of things. Uh, John Gleason always talks about the stop and frisk in New York and how persons are, you know, were randomly selected and it did not seem random. It seemed like there was always a certain block of people were being arrested, stopped, frisked, sometimes going uh, 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 to jail, sometimes sitting there in jail forever out there in Rikers. And then, and then your lawyer comes up to you, look, your trial is going to be in another year or you can go home today if you please. He mentions that sort of scenario all the time. I think about a school district in Mississippi that had, uh, uh, in Meridian, Mississippi, that had a prison to uh, a schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline where, where students who got involved in infractions at school, elementary, middle school, high school students, they, instead of calling the, going to the principal's office, the police were called and the kids were arrested. I mean, and, and the Department of Justice came down and did an investigation and there was a consent decree. Uh, you know, so I think about those types of things, that sort of diversity of experience and, and what one brings to the table and thinking about how we implement policy, what we think about what we do. So one of the things that we will be doing is looking at this brain science looking at how children ought to be treated differently, maybe, or, you know, but of course, of course, there are those who see a rash of crime uh, 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 that, that children are involved in. Young men, young adults, or whatever, maybe some being used by older adults, maybe. Some of them make it irrational, rash decisions, Maybe you look at recidivism. So your pre-sentence report uh, takes into account all of this information and all of that is viewed globally uh, uh, by the judges in imposing their sentences. So after having heard all of that testimony or after we hear all of that testimony, we will deliberate, we will work hard to try to come to unanimous agreement, well, we will make decisions about how these guidelines maybe ought to be revised, maybe not be revised, but we're going to engage in deep conversation. Again, bringing that diversity of experience that we all have, bringing our own ideas and our own philosophies and our own things the way we see the world, bringing that together marshal through and then come through, make a decision, and we will submit whatever decisions we have to Congress in May, and Congress will have from May, uh, May 1st until November the 1st to either sign off on what we did by not acting or either taking an affirmative step to over to overturn or to revise or to otherwise tell us, go, go back to the drawing board. Congress can do that. Now, whether they can do it or whether they will do it is probably two or three different questions. Uh, but right now, the, that is what is on the horizon of, of for the year to come. I would encourage you, if you have any, and you can go back and look at our old hearing from last year. Uh, we had sets of theories last year. We had, because the some of the 
uh, findings that we made, some of the rulings that we made would impact those who are currently incarcerated. We have to take up an issue of whether or not we should make our things that we did last year retroactive. So there's a set of uh, hearings that deal with retroactivity. Judge, if, if you all are implementing this, uh, you're taking away criminal history count, for example, because one thing that, again, following the research, one thing that we learned is that persons with a zero criminal history, we have been treating those persons the same as those persons with one criminal history point. And those are just, the research shows that if you have zero criminal history, your chance of recidivism was much less than those with even one, but we have been treating them over the years and decades, the Sentencing Commission has been treated the same, but we pulled them apart. And so there were those who were serving time in prison throughout the country who had that zero history from the point. So now whether what we did on that day would be applied retroactive to affect them to, to sort of free them possibly, well, we had to have hearings on that. And we chose to make it retroactive because there were many of us who felt like that was, you know, about 20,000 years of citizens out there where people uh, uh, had been served. And, 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 and as I remind uh, persons at most of my citizens here, many of the judges who are imposing these sentences, because we have to now, we have a job to do. Many of us, as George, uh, uh, Judge George Hazel, who used to sit in the District of Maryland, nobody knows what it's like to serve a day in prison. Many of us have never served one day. One day. But there is not, there, there is not one of us, I don't believe, who has not imposed a sentence of less than 10 years or five because there's mandatory minimum. So, so I know each of us has got a mandatory minimum of sentencing somebody to 10 years in prison, sometimes 15 years, sometimes because of the nature and type of the crime. Child pornography, for example, you might have a mandatory minimum of 30 years. Sometimes because of the young person might have been involved in multiple uh, uh, robberies during the course of one day, who has brandished a firearm at one place, uh, shot a firearm at another place, all in the same day, and stole something out of, or attempted to steal something out of the store, a bag of chips, that's all you got away with, or you got $5 because that was all in the register. Well, we know all of those sentences had to have been imposed consecutively. So there are many of us who have sentenced people to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And, and you know, when I talk about hundreds and hundreds, I'm talking about, I'm talking about, you know, 199 months. I'm talking about you know, some people more than 50 years, 60 years in prison because we had to. But not many of us have ever served a day in prison. So we have to understand what that life is like. And we have an institutional obligation in the Citizen Commission to sort of make sure, because that's one of the things that we've been working on this year, is that BOP is doing all of the things that they can do to make sure that persons who are in their care custody for these months, for these years, that when they return to the uh, return to where they came from, because that's where they're going to go most of the time, you're going to go right back to the place where you was from where you were sentenced. Make sure that you can function. Make sure that you're equipped to come back into the world. So those are the things that are before the Sentencing Commission. Uh, I, I know I've yeah, talked a long time. I want to make sure we get yeah, other. I, I know I've talked a long time, but we're going to uh, 
uh, be here for for this conversation. Uh, but I thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Judge. 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 Thank you, every every cycle of amendments and and they absolutely watch the hearings i'm planning to this week because they're so fascinating to see all the stakeholders that judge reese talked about give their perspective on the range of issues that the commission confronts every year against this backdrop we've heard about how judge reese and the sentencing commission considers a range of perspectives in order to build the rules the sentencing guidelines that judges consider in each of their sentencing but now we're lucky enough to have two great judges uh, to talk about sort of how they see in their individual sentencing how those rules specifically apply. And I will start with Chief Judge Marbley, uh, in part because uh, Judge Cole liked that this question made you sound old. Uh, I that, am old. Uh, that you were, you're the only judge of here who I believe sentenced before the Supreme Court's landmark Booker ruling converted these guidelines from what was mandate. You were obliged, unless you could find uh, a limited departure factor. You were obliged to follow the guidelines until the Supreme Court's work in 2005 said, well, for these complicated constitutional reasons, we think now the guidelines should be advisory. So you've had a, a period sentencing under mandatory guidelines, and then now an, even a longer period sentencing under these advisory guidelines. I know at the time of that ruling, there was talk, oh, we can abolish the commission. You know, what's the point of having a commission change the guidelines now that they're just advice? instead of mandate, but I'd love if you have a minute or two, Chief Judge, just talk about seeing the guidelines evolve that way and whether that changed how you looked both at the guidelines and at your individual sentences. You and I talked about Booker and how that changed the Simpson regime, but I want to make sure everybody can hear you. Is it, can we have mics here if need be? Can people hear in the back? Oh, we're good. I'm good and loud. I know that. Yeah, so am I. But <laughs> <laughs> but post Booker, I felt that uh, district court judges have been free uh, because before that it was very formulaic, you know, and and uh, you know when you deal with someone's life uh, in what is supposed to be an individualized sentencing regime. It was very difficult to achieve what I felt were just results under the uh, sort of rigid, mandatory uh, sentencing guidelines. But once Booker took hold, and once we felt free to navigate, uh, you know, it gave you latitude. It gave you latitude to consider the individual person in making your. Uh, uh, sentencing decisions because you can look at a host of factors. And I think that one of the good things, however, from being a free booker district judge is that you learn it was almost a Pavlovian response. You were going to the guidelines first. And that's what you still have to do. But you went to the guidelines first and you figured out how somebody sat in that range. But now, I still automatically, as required, go to the guidelines first, but then I can look at other factors. And looking at other factors enables you to construct a sentence that is both individualized and keeping with the purpose of having an advisory uh, guideline uh, sentence. But I, I'm sure that probably the biggest difference is that I now have uh, far more variances uh, than I did pre booker I have, I still have a handful of departures, but far more variances. And, you know, I still look at Jason to, to see if I'm generally in the ballpark of where other judges across the country are with defendants in a uh, similar circumstance. But uh, I think that as a judge, you experience the art of judging now before uh, you were like an automaton. Uh, I'll do a little translation for the guideline novices out there. Departure was the term of art for how you could go outside the guidelines when they were mandatory, but in part because they were very limited and rigid uh, in a lot of their particulars, 
uh, many judges, as Chief Judge Marley was discussing, felt very uh, tied and tethered to a guideline system that often seemed uh, unduly severe. Once the guidelines became advisory, the term of art for going outside the guidelines other than a departure was what was called a variance, or gets known as a variance from the guideline range. And in fact, I'll come back to Judge Reeves because one of the commission uh, topics these days is whether to keep that lingo of both a departure and a variance integral to the way in which this all works. And then we'll also talk, uh, hopefully we'll have time to talk about Jason, which is the commission's work to accumulate or highlight uh, what cumulative patterns are for judges uh, in the system. And maybe this is a good use to go to Judge Cole and ask sort of where the guidelines fit, where maybe the data that Jason collects fit in your own uh, uh, thinking about sentencing as a, uh, I'll call you still a newer judge, but uh, you know, it, it's uh, among the things the commission knows now and that the Supreme Court said in subsequent cases was that the guidelines are to be a starting point, an initial benchmark. Is that how lawyers in your courtroom approach it? Is that how you approach sentencing? Or is it a more sort of holistic process where the guidelines are just kind of one piece of a much broader mosaic, including maybe the data that we see in, in the Jason tool that the commission has created? Yeah, so um, you know, I, I've only sentenced people under the advisory uh, guidelines. Uh, and I've never been in a world where there was a mandatory limited sentencing range has always been a starting point. I do take that pretty seriously. Uh, you, you need to go through and do all those calculations and, and figure out what the guidelines say. Um, but so one, th one thing I think is different, um, you know, ch the chief said it's free, and I, I think that's right. And another reaction though is that uh, because the guidelines are not mandatory, sort of the moral weight of what you're doing is, is really on you, right? You're sending someone to prison for some extended period of time, and you don't have to do that in any sense of the, you know, have to, unless there may be a statutory minimum, mandatory minimum involved or something like that. But so you have to take that full weight of the fact you're sending this person in front of you uh, to prison. Um, and often they are uh, people who have not had uh, the same childhood as, as most of the, the people in this room. And so that there's, there's a lot of troubling parts as you kind of think through that, um, taking that, that weight on of saying, well, because of what's happened, you need to go to prison for some kind of period of time. Right? And so the, the, the guidelines serve as kind of an anchor point, really an, a starting point more than an anchor point. But, and, and I hope, my hope in sentencing is that there is um, some kind of generalized uniformity with individualized determinations about defendants but that we are part of a system where we have a rule of law in the country and that, you know, that one thing I think the guidelines were trying to do when they were adopted was there was a recognition that in various, various judges and or various districts that there'd be a wide disparity. So people doing the same thing with the same criminal history were getting wildly divergent sentences. And people were concerned that that meant maybe we didn't really have a rule of law. We just had kind of random sentences being handed out to people. And so we wanted to bring more uniformity to that. And that, that was, I think, a laudable goal of the sentencing guidelines was to try to create some semblance of uniformity. And so I do appreciate um, the guidelines serving that function. I do think it's helpful that they're now advisory, but then you say, well, then if they're advisory, how do they help bring uniformity? They serve as a starting point for your calculation. But then I think the Sentencing Commission, to its credit, also has tools like Jason, which we were just talking about, which allow you to kind of dig into some of the data about not what do the guidelines say, but what are judges around the country actually doing with respect to similarly situated defendants. And you can you can dig down. There's, there's also an interactive database tool. There's there's a variety of tools that you can use to try to get some sense of what are other judges doing. And and I do think for me it's an important check because. I want to think that as judges, we're all kind of within some broad range understandings that she said there's individualized determination. Still, there should be some kind of overarching story you can tell. So things like Jason help. I do wish more attorneys were aware of and um, uh, competent with Jason to sort of help explain what that data says and could help be part of an adversarial conversation about what that data says really um, often it ends up just being the judges kind of using it without 
much give and take with uh, the council, at least that's been my experience with it so far. But I think there are tools out there. And, you know, sentencing is a very data, could be a very data driven process. We heard uh, Judge Reeves talk about they're trying to use data and what they're doing, but you can use it in individualized sentencing, but you have to be aware of it. You have to use it and you have to make it part of your presentation to the court. Thank you very much, Judge. And I will sort of add a little data to all of this, which still shocks me when I even reflect on it. Roughly speaking, there's what 55,000, 56,000 federal sentences imposed every single year. So that means on average, every day, today, 200 people are being sentenced in federal courts across the nation. So when we're talking about kind of the scope of the problem, the scope of the issues, you know, tracking 200 data points, let alone 55,000, let alone, you know, what the commission's doing, looking over years of data, uh, you know, can be extraordinarily challenging. And obviously you have the added challenge whether it's pandemic, whether it's uh, crime concerns that are flaring in different parts of the country at different times with different crimes, all just add to the challenge of sorting through the data effectively. Because I do think there's a tendency to say, well, let's make it data driven and that'll solve everything. And it's, it's you need the help of advocates, uh, the lawyers in the courtroom to help sort that data. I don't know if you have Judge Reeves, just something to talk about how the commission uses data and how the commission interacts with individual judges about sort of providing data and trying to help them do their job. Yeah, every judge can, each judge can require, request from the commission, for example, of what, 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 what is going on with my cases. You know, how do I look in comparison with those in my district, for example? And we run that data uh, uh, all the time of what judges, the Jason tool and the Ida tool, and, and for those who, uh, and have done any federal service, you know, we're all into acronyms. Uh, 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 Jason is J S I N, Ida is I D A, and I can't even think of it. But, but anyway, it's the interactive tools that we use. And yes, we train people. That's, that's a huge component of what the Sentencing Commission does. We train judges and we train practitioners and probation officers, uh, do trainings all the time, every day. Uh, in various areas, and we have national trainings, so that everybody can be equipped with the information so that they can argue before the judge that, Judge, this is a type of sentence that is both appropriate for this particular defendant because, you know, just look at this. And then the judge uses his or her discretion, and, and, and the other tools that the judge has is Title 18 U.S.C. 3553 which sets forth those factors that you have to sort of look at and should be concerned with when imposing any sentence. But we have to underscore that the law requires us to only impose a sentence which is sufficient, but not greater than necessary. So the least sentence is the one that, the, you know, that Congress has told us uh, to impose. Yeah, absolutely. The statutory guidance with this parsimony provision is sometimes called is, uh, I always think is the most challenging thing you all face because you got to find, I've heard some judges talk about it as the Goldilocks principle. The sentence has to be sufficient, but not greater than necessary. And how you figure that out across you know, a range of options can be incredibly challenging. Against that backdrop, I guess I really want to drill into whether your experiences or your own perspectives uh, lead to any particular factors, whether they're factors related to the crime, you know, maybe the defendant uh, had a drug addiction or, you know, first offender status we were talking about, uh, or maybe I'm really actually talking about the defendant there as well, factors relating to the defendant that make you either particularly likely to be suspicious of the guidelines, you know, a particular kind of 3553A factor that, as you see that on the pre-sentence report, Judge Reed was talking about that, makes you inclined to say, all right, I'm not sure this is going to be one of those guideline cases. This one, this one feels different to me, or does that just sort of happen case by case? You got to look at every factor in the case. Again, rarely does one particular factor jump out. Again, I know the commission is working on juvenile prior offenses, and one of those things that I suspect your data is showing more and more judges are being attentive to as they think about whether or not to follow the guidelines. I certainly know criminal history has been something more generally that's been a big topic of the commission's work and debate, but I'm wondering if there, when you see that pre-sentence report, is there one particular thing that sometimes jumps out as like, uh-oh, this is not as the uh-oh, but this is the kind of case where I'm not sure the guidelines are going are to help you as much as other factors, or doesn't doesn't quite work that way. Yeah, so um, I think there are, are uh, 
certain types of crimes and sometimes the guidelines to me are not very predictive of what judges actually do. I, I you know, we find people handle a little bit about how some of the um, child porn guidelines lead immediately to really, really, really high sentences that are sometimes I think not in keeping with the practice of judges in those kinds of cases. If you look at actual sentences imposed versus guideline calculations. So there, there's sometimes where you where you go in thinking, well, for this crime, whatever, whatever I get back on the guideline calculation might not be quite as reliable a starting point as, as other things. There's there's other, I guess it's factors like that. Sometimes you look at, you know, like in fraud cases or things like that, it's a lot of it's triggered to money. And as the money goes up, you get very big increases in, in the offense levels. But sometimes the nature of the, the offense leads to these higher numbers that aren't necessarily, in my mind, always reflective of the of the um, the conduct and, and the sanction that should be meted out. So I, I think it's more like certain aspects of the guidelines jump out to me when I see what's what's giving an enhancement in a given uh, a given case. Now with the first step back, you also have to be, I think, mindful that if you find certain guidelines apply, like um, the leader, uh, if you get points for being a leader uh, or organizer, if you get that enhancement, then you're not going to qualify for certain um, time off credits in prison under the First Step Act. And, and, and so now there's with some of these things where you can earn good time credits in prison for engaging in things like education or things like that. You Somebody could get a 10-year sentence and end up serving five years or less if they get all these credits. What they might not qualify for. And so it becomes, you just need to be mindful about what you're doing in the process and what implications it's going to have, not merely for the sentence you're announcing, but for how much time somebody might actually serve. And that can cut either way. I mean, I, I remember at the sentencing um, conference we had in Seattle last fall, uh, there were you know, a number of judges who were kind of dismayed about, I gave a 14 year sentence and I found out this person was being released after seven years. and. We, you know, we used to talk, what about truth and sentencing? And that's the way the federal system is supposed to work. And so it can cut either way, but you know, I, I think you just need to be mindful about the um, collateral impacts of, of certain things that happen during the sentence process. I, I agree with uh, my, my friend and colleague here. And and uh, one of the things that I look at, that's the first thing. No, I, <laughs> I love the first thing. Yeah, we, we've been buddies for over three years. But one of the things I look at the nature and circumstances of the crime. Because in doing that, you can look at the behavior of the defendant, but you can also, more importantly, look at the impact on the victim. And so that will begin to inform my thinking on what type of crime will be a just and fair sentence. Then I look at family background, and, and you raised up the, the uh, uh, child pornography cases. And I remember as a new judge, uh, you know, I, I, I imposed some fairly harsh sentences, always within the guidelines. I don't know that I've ever departed beyond the recommended guideline range, pre-book, uh, particularly child pornography cases. But then I began to see a pattern. And in almost all of those cases, the the perpetrator, the defendant, herself or himself had been victimized as a child. And so, and then we have a, we've had a somewhat broken mental health system in this country where we're now just focusing on the consequences of uh, mental health issues that have gone unattended. And many of these defendants are replicating the kind of behavior to which they were subjected as children. And so, you know, it's not a one size fits all paradigm. And it can't be because you have, and I know that uh, back in the day, family circumstances was not a favored departure. But now I, I really look at a person's background Doug pointed it out at the beginning. He said, yeah, most of our defendants aren't from your neck of the woods. They didn't have, uh, you know, the so-called nuclear family. They certainly 
most of us did not have the educational opportunities that gave you an entree to one of the great law schools we have in our country. And I'm talking about Ohio State. <laughs> Doug thought I was talking about University of Chicago. Yeah, wait, wait, but I'm right. talking about Ohio State. <laughs> the Morris College. But so those kinds of things you have to really focus on. And that's the benefit of a post book of citizen regime. And that's the benefit of, of now having a uh, citizen commission that, that has a portal that can keep up with the time. They can, you know, look at how things are changing. The First Step Act, and uh, you know, these amendments that you just uh, uh, promulgated that are went into effect in February, and so there are a number of amendments that give us additional uh, flexibility in imposing a sentence that will be uh, good for this individual taking as you describe it, Professor Berman, a more holistic approach. I just echo everything uh, that they have said. I, you know, I'm the newest one to this system of the three of us. And, and uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I was like, I haven't said the same thing. Right? Like, you're like, you guys have all given decades of prison time. I'm like, oh, my name. So, uh, but I find myself still learning. And it's so useful. It is so useful to have competent counsel on both sides. It, that's why we must invest in our public defense system on our state level and, and even our federal level. Because the public defenders are great. They're good. Uh, but we also, because we don't have enough federal public defenders, they have to go out and associate uh, a CJA counsel. We have to make sure that they're armed and equipped and that they can advocate with the best people on the U.S. attorney side to make sure that these issues, that these issues ought to be brought up before the prospective judge. And, and, and yes, I, I rely a lot on what type of information I'm not necessarily being fed but, but what are the arguments on why I should do something other than what my initial inclination and as most judges' initial inclination is, is to impose a guideline sentence. But that guideline sentence may not be the sufficient sentence. And that guideline sentence can be, in many cases, much more punitive than it should be. Yeah, just to pick up on something Judge Reed said, I, I do think that defense counsel really do their clients a favor in sentencing when they place the conduct at issue and for which the person is being sentenced, sort of in a broader picture of this whole person's life, kind of explaining what brought them, uh, not excusing it, but explaining kind of what happened in a, in a, in a broader context. And I've, I've seen criminal defense attorneys who are incredibly good and yeah, they're they're not it's not exactly a play for sympathy, but it's it's a play for empathy and understanding um, kind of what brought this this whole person before you, and then an explanation of how the the sanction that they're going to get for this conduct might be helpful in kind of you know turning things around. And I think everybody on the stage probably wishes there were like more resources at BOP for rehabilitation and, and other things like that. But within the, the system in which we operate, trying to sort of rationalize a sentence in terms of the um, its ability to maybe make a change in, in the defendant's life as well, and, and serve as I sometimes say during sentencing, you serve as a wake up call. And you know, it's 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 a little bit of a sock to myself to make me feel better about what I'm doing, right? But um, but but hopefully it, it can. But but defense attorneys who can can use their time to really make this person into a person and and tell their story. I, I think that's really helpful in the discretionary system. I, I absolutely agree. One of the things that I found a lot of really good defense attorneys doing our, our federal local federal defender does a great job of this is to also put into context the likelihood of recidivism. That's always a very important factor in determining the sentence because some person who 
as Judge Reeves said, stated earlier, young kid got caught up in group think and you want to look at them and say, what about this robbery seemed like a good idea? <laughs> but but we were dealing with the mind of an 18-year-old. But the likelihood of this 18-year-old, I just had a crew of kids, none of whom were was plenty. Uh, engaged in a series of robberies. They got called almost immediately. And, and you know, I know that no need to give them a long service. I think that most of them, there were a couple who could even start a college. Most of them will have a wake-up call by spending, let's say, let's say 36 months uh, away from home in a very hostile environment. So, you know, it is always persuasive when defense counsel can point to factors and put it out there, showing that this person is not likely to recidivate, but there were factors in his or her life that brought them to this point. It, it's funny you said 36 months in the hospital environment, because that also describes University of Chicago Law School. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, I hope we can go until 1.30 because I like having this captive audience of judges and I also want to have the audience have a chance to ask questions if anybody is, is so inclined to do so. Needless to say, I could have a thousand questions. I'd like to stir the pot with a little acquitted conduct talk. I know in part because I've cited it repeatedly, Judge Marbley, you Judge Marbley, your opinion on acquitted conduct a long time ago in a bunch of briefs, but, uh, and, and, and Judge Reeves may feel disinclined to say too much at this moment, but if you want to just kind of express what is always my mystery of how this is still a very big live issue that people can get sentenced based on acquitted conduct. In fact, and I will just sort of round this out because it was part of my own commentary to the commission in this cycle. Uh, whatever you think about the nuances of this, in our current guideline system, you're sentenced on acquitted conduct exactly the same as convicted conduct. So the fact that it's an acquittal not only doesn't prevent it from being used, it doesn't prevent it from being used exactly as if you had been convicted of the exact same thing in the guideline calculation. That to me is why I'm hopeful the commission will at the very least change its rules for the calculation of the guidelines, but it is a, a challenging intricate issue and I know you've spent some time thinking about it. If, uh, if that was one thing that drove me crazy, it, it is acquitted conduct. You sit through a trial, I just had a trial, I sat through it, husband and wife, they were acquitted on a number of charges, they were convicted on a number of charges. And then the prosecutor at sentencing legitimately asked me to consider using a lower standard than the reasonable doubt standard uh, to consider this in enhancing the sentence. I will tell you, because we, we are having a civil <laughs> exactly what I thought about that argument. I'll simply say it did not prevail because it just a uh, reach of being fundamentally unfair that you can be effectively tried twice because you you try first uh, under the highest standard and then secondly under a civil law standard and then that can enhance your sentence as if the jury had found you guilty anyway so I don't think that it's fair to give two bites at the apple and then to have Basically, a judge finding the, the, a jury of your peers acquitted you. But now you can ask the judge, use a lesser standard, use this against them anyway. And that, that, that seems to fly in the face of any of you know, the fundamental principles of American law. I just think it's unfair. So uh, I. I... I agree with a, a lot of what the chief said. You know, I, I just to put on the lawyer hat a little bit, um, right? And so it's think about acquitted conduct. So you you've got two counts, count one and count two. You get acquitted on count one. You get uh, found guilty on count two, and count two carries with it a zero to twenty um, sentencing range, right? And, and so zero years to twenty. Years. And that's part of the, part of the issue here. Is what we're talking about is that most of the crimes for which people get convicted in federal court have incredibly broad sentencing ranges. It will be zero to 20, right? And so, where do you locate someone within there? And what the chief was pointing out is that um, 
usually the guideline calculation for someone who's found guilty of count two is obviously it's going to locate them in zero to 20, right? Then we, we know that. But um, how do you, how do, what do you look at inside of where between zero and 20? And the guidelines say we should look at all these different factors. And it turns out that one of the factors you look at is what's called relevant conduct. And that means other um, conduct that was related to the offense, which has to be found by a preponderance of the evidence in order to be considered as part of the sentencing determination. So what these acquitted conduct cases say is, well, the fact you were found not guilty, i.e. they couldn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, doesn't mean that you didn't do it, i.e. by a preponderance of the evidence. And so we can consider that in deciding not to impose a new sanction under count one, which would have also carried maybe zero to 20, but also simply in deciding where to locate you within the zero to 20 for the crime for which you were found guilty. Now, I will say it does, so that's the lawyer hat, right? It, it all sort of makes kind of logical sense, but then you start thinking about the, the practical consequences of it, and you keep running back into what the chief said, which is, right, but so now you're asking me to believe that the person did the thing that the jury just said he wasn't guilty of, and I understand that there's a difference between saying not guilty and innocent, right? We've all learned that in, in criminal law, and, and so there is space there. And so it, it intellectually makes sense that you could have an abiding conviction, no pun intended, that this person actually did this and yet they weren't found guilty of it. And so in thinking about how dangerous this person is, well, it certainly looks like they committed a murder. I understand they weren't found guilty of it, but you know, it kind of looks like it. And, and so that informs your notion about how, how dangerous the person is, which then may push you further up within the range for the crime to which they were found guilty. So it isn't, they're, they're not being pushed outside that range. I want to be very clear about that. So they're, they're not being exposed to new liability, but they are in a sense, facing a higher consequence because of the acquitted conduct. And it, it is, it, it's a little odd. I, I do find those cases a little <laughs> odd because you've got a jury verdict saying they weren't guilty and yet now it shows up as a four point enhancement leading to a higher advisory guideline. Right. Yes, well, so now, now we're describing me a little odd, but uh, that's fine. And uh, I want to, is there any last moment for questions? I know people may have class at, at 1.30, so apologies for keeping folks late, but no apologies for keeping these folks late because it's so wonderful to hear what they have to say. Not seeing any hands from the audience, I just encourage you to join me in thanking all I also want to thank all of you for coming out, and I think uh, Judge Reed did a particularly nice job of saying go to the commission's website if any of these issues interest you. You can also come to my office. Like I say, I'm especially grateful they all keep me in a job, and I'm looking forward to continue conversation about all these topics as uh, we continue to try to bend the arc of sentencing justice uh, towards the right direction. So thank you all again. Appreciate it.